Don't worry. When I walked in this morning and realized we were running behind schedule, I cut my slides down to like two. Um, and I, I, I'm, I want to thank Cicada for embracing me this year on my sabbatical from the University of Michigan into their community of thought and practice. And I want to thank all of you for um, welcoming me into this event. I'm learning as I listen. And I want to um, try to be very efficient today um, to give you a snapshot of some of the kinds of work that are relevant for this axis and for this community from my own backyard in the state of Michigan in the United States of America at this time, um, which is to say largely Anishinaabe territory, which um, as you may know, comprises many different um, entities, Chippewa, Ojibwe, well, Ojibwe, Odawa, um, and I will be presenting a little bit of background on some of the partners, students, and allies who have taught me the most about the, the challenges of indigenous conservation there. In particular, I want to focus on three frontiers that I see as being useful for what you called for earlier this morning, which is strategy. What can we think of as strategic frontiers for our work together in our time here? And I think that from what I'm seeing in my own university, in my own state, um, the, there are three ways for us to focus some of our discussion. Um, I should say before I dive into that, that I myself am an anthropologist by training, but I teach in a school of environment and sustainability. So I often work with professional students who are working more to make a change in the world than to make a career in research and science. Um, I am also someone who I, I would say to you in, for example, the language of Sango, the field language I speak in the Central African Republic, where I work with forest foragers and fisher group, fishing groups, right? So that's Sango, which is a Yubangi language in the Congo Basin in the Central African Republic. And it, what I've said is to say that my own research is there and to thank those there who have taught me so much about collaboration and who would thank you if they could for the work you're doing in these North American, Australian and other settings to advance access rights and strategies for the protection of crucial cultural and biological resources. Although they are not here with me, um, and although I am not speaking of them today, I would like to recognize the value of the work we are doing here for those communities in equatorial Africa. Um, I know that they would be very excited by this group. So the three frontiers I see from my own backyard in Michigan and for our group here today are, number one, the changes we need to make in our own research and, and teaching institutions and curricula. The way we do our work as researchers is all too often um, creating what I think Raymond Da Silva just f sort of called out as a lack of connection, um, a, a veneration of abstract knowledge and a veneration of disconnections rather than connections. Um, and I would like to recognize today the disparate and unjust distribution of the work for those changes that I see my students, particularly my native students, um, doing in our institution, but how effective I think they are being. So that will be one frontier, is, is reflexivity about what it means to do research and education on these issues right now and how we can think with that. F frontier number two is one that many of the panelists have already spoken about, which is this really fascinating frontier for me of um, fluid hydrological and oceanographic kinds of frontiers versus land. Um, and I do believe that Michigan is ground zero in many respects against its will in the emerging politics of fresh, clean water access. This is true not only through cities like Flint, Michigan, but also with respect to pipelines like Enbridge's Line 5 pipeline. And I see tribal administrations, um, native scholars connecting with urban urban advocates for post-industrial cities, rust belt cities in very interesting ways. We are watching our capacity to detect toxins and chemicals 
explode. And as we, as a broad scientific community, as we realize how many heavy metals and chemicals are in the drinking water everywhere, there is a whole new set of opportunities and challenges for what we're calling conservation and protection of resources, which I believe is a dialogue that um, could be very fruitful for some of us in this group to, to think with. River systems, I mean, the, the talk by Marama was absolutely nourishing to me and exciting to me about um, what we can draw upon from the pioneering work on rivers such as hers to animate the water protector movement, which as many of you know is maturing in the United States and being led in many cases by those from different tribes and, and entities um, that have long been marginalized in the US. So one frontier then is reflexive change in our own ways of doing research, another is um, thinking with water. And the final one is thinking and expressing our findings, not only in texts, but also with digital media, speaking to the community-based. Um. So, so I am going to start with the last one and tell you that I am leading an initiative at the University of Michigan right now um, called Gala, which is named for an apple that grows in Michigan, but also for a, a party. It's a, an open access platform which contains case studies that can be authored by anyone it is free, and it is at www.learngala.com. And if any of you are interested, we could talk about that later. I wanted to say that um, as I've begun to build those cases, I have been collaborating with scholars to look at how the cases are usable, both in K through 12 classrooms, university classrooms, and community settings. And we've had to think very hard about those cases um, how they depict, in particular, indigenous groups and stakeholders, that word. <laughs> um, so I, I, I have been very impressed by the ways in which working in audio and digital media, as well as text, um, we have been able to tell not unconventional stories. And I would like to suggest that we think with um, those efforts. Those are the efforts that have brought me into collaboration with um, those I will tell you about now from Michigan and with whom I'm collaborating on the question of water protection. Um, let's see if we can. One of the first is a student at the University of Michigan Law School and in our school, the School for Environment and Sustainability. Johnny has been working with us not only to identify flaws in our audio and visual materials for teaching about conflicts which connect um, Anishinaabe communities in Michigan with livestock producers and state officials, natural resource managers, Republican legislators, and others. Conflicts like wolf hunting, walleye fishing, water quality, right? So we are not only producing these cases, we are also translating them into languages like French, where they can be taught in places like the Congo Basin, reminding peoples there that wildlife conflict is everywhere. It is not only their problem. Many of us here also struggle. And in working with Johnny to develop modules about water in Michigan, I learned a great deal about what he calls um, the ways in which, as you see on the slide, the lakes are our grandmothers. Anishinaabe, or Odawa, Ojibwa, and Borobamik have lived in the Great Lakes since time immemorial, and their connection with the water is unbreakable. So Johnny has developed modules in which we can take students online through kind of an open online course to understand better about the histories of those connections, but also the legislative and um, bureaucratic and administrative obstacles to fully living those connections for these people at this time. One effort Johnny has made, and now I'm moving from the digital media frontier to the reflexive change in our research institutions frontier, he has marshaled documents that have made the University of Michigan, for the first time in its history, address the fact that its own biostation and its own research facilities are located on territory that was unjustly appropriated from these groups that Johnny's um, coming from. And it has been a remarkable um, feat, I think, to be able to continue effectively in your studies and at the same time advocate to redress or address injustices in the history of the very institution where you are learning. I feel there's a great deal of bravery here, and I would like to suggest that um, 
you know, myself, in attempting to become a tenured faculty member at the University of Michigan, I could hardly engage with these struggles. I now have more time and I'm trying to be a good ally and a good supporter to those who are making these changes in our institution, making our school and our university more equitable and more open about these histories of appropriation. And at the same time, weaving them into new forms of curricula so that we can teach and learn from them. My final slide is here, and I use it last because I want to talk a little bit um, about this question of um, frontiers between water and land and the forms of governance that are emerging. I would say hybrid governance out of the challenges of advocacy for both um, access to clean water, protection of clean water and lands. Um, the people in this photograph include Nahira Sharif, who's a, an activist from Flint, Michigan and founder of several really effective campaigns and organizations in the interest of protecting Flint residents. Also on the, on the left you see Lynn Bardwell who um, is enrolled uh, Little Traverse Bay uh, Odawa. She'll be here for the North American Dialogue in just a few days. Um, these kinds of alliances between, and, and this was taken at a screening of a film linked with our open access online learning platform. Again, trying to bring together public media, learning media, and collaborative energies across the different groups of people who care and are concerned about water. Um, the, those featured, and, and Lynn has a degree in public policy from Grand Valley State, but I will just say that she has been um, touring with this film and connecting with folks from Flint and from the Navajo Nation. Janine Yassi, who I don't have time to introduce you to today, is a Navajo or Diné activist who is, has run for office, who has taken on roles in formal representative political process. Not unlike Johnny and his law degree, Lynn and her public policy degree. These are legacies of the strong public education uh, in our states and the ways in which people have at last gotten access to that. But they also are overlaid on tribal administrations and traditional governance structures in, in ways that I find really wonderful and perhaps one of the most exciting frontiers of all. So using digital media to connect people in ways that make our own institutions better, but that also create engagement with democracy. There is a disproportionate amount of work being done to protect our democracy at civic, state, and national levels by these kinds of activists. And I just want to call out that remarkable work that's being done and suggest that somewhere between land and sea and river and tap in the inner cities of our country, there is enormous amount of power and hope coming to. So I'd be happy to talk about that later, and thanks for your attention.